Joining me now, First Class Father Dave Linegar. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Well, thank you very much. Well, it's an honor to have you here. Let's start like this. How many kids do you have? How old are they? I've got four. They're all in their 50s. Uh, I started when I was very young, so uh, I'm still a very young man for them. Yeah, any grandkids along the way here? No, we had this discussion about birds and the bees, and it must have worked or something. So it's just <laughs> us. Wow. Well, if you could, Dave, please, uh, for those who don't know, take a minute to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Um, I am the co-founder of a uh, real estate network called Remax. We're in 120 countries, about 140,000 sales associates. Um, we were founded in January of 73. And so the uh, it's been quite an adventure building a business like that and having the family that have the opportunity to have. Yeah, I don't think there's any bigger name in real estate than uh, than Remax. You guys have built really a uh, real estate empire. It's amazing what you've done. And and I'll ask you right off the hip here. I mean, a lot of the, the listeners I have on this show are dads, young dads, young guys that are just starting their families out. And obviously, uh, it's the hope of everybody to um, to try to buy their first home for their family and all that. So uh, what kind of advice do you have here for the young couple, the young dad that's out there right now looking to get into the market and try to buy a home for his family? Well, obviously, the uh, uh, interest rates for the last 15 years were dramatically lower than any time in the last 50. The average interest rate uh, since we started Remax is 7.6%. Uh, However, the interest rate for the last 15 years has been incredibly uh, low. As a matter of fact, uh, even as a little bit less than 3%. That's an anomaly that's probably only happened once in the last 100 years, so uh, probably not to be continued. Uh, but do bear in mind that home is, a, is an incredible investment. Uh, if you're renting, you're paying somebody else's mortgage off, and so you might as well be paying your own. Uh, the problem is getting your foot in the door with a starter home, uh, and which is a little bit challenging and a bit difficult. Uh, and right now, uh, the inventory is a little bit low because People that have a, a property with a 3% mortgage on them, uh, even though they'd like to move up maybe to a more expensive property, means that whatever they do, they're going to have to pay a higher fee. And so most people would rather keep the 3% mortgage than do without the larger property. So for the next year or two, it's going to be a struggle, but uh, uh, everybody figures a way to do it. Uh, we sold houses successfully when they were fighting inflation back in 1981, and uh, interest rates had gone from 7% to 16.5%. So it, it's achievable, uh, but uh, the whole point is the, the sooner you can buy, the better you'll be because house prices will continue to go up. Uh, this youngest generation is the biggest generation in history, much bigger than the baby boom generation. And, you know, people want to buy a home. Uh, it's quoted in Wall Street 20 years ago. Uh, they said, well, what do you think about all the young people that want to live downtown? They want to be to the sports, the bars, the theater and stuff. And I said, well, that's all well and good. But once you're married, and you've got a couple of kids, uh, your world changes. You, you want parks and you want a place to have a dog. You want to be, be able to walk to the school and you want to get away from the traffic. And so that's proven true in the last five years is a tremendous shift in population of younger people moving to the suburbs. Part of it because it's uh, easier to afford something in the suburbs, but for all the other reasons too. So uh, whenever you can figure it out, find yourself a trusted advisor, get a full-time real estate professional uh, that's experienced, that has, uh, works in the price range that you'll be looking at and let them help you do it. Yeah, it, really great stuff, Dave. And, and there are two theories of thought on this. Like I've had guys like Grant Cardone on the podcast here who uh, always says, don't buy a home. He says it's a bad investment. He encourages young people to, to, to not buy a home at all. And the, the other theory on that would be then if you are renting, you are paying somebody else who owns the property. So it doesn't seem like that's a great way to go either. So I don't know which one is the, is the better financial move uh, for the young dad. That's starting. I know for my own self, um, I was living in a studio apartment when I was by myself. Uh, when I met my wife and got married, we lived in a two-bedroom apartment in, in a city. 
And then we bought our first home, which was a small home in the suburbs. We moved out. And then now we bought the bigger home, a step up. We have four kids. So now we have a you know much bigger home and stuff like that. So that was the route we took. But there is that theory that the home is the bad investment because you're paying the bank, the loan. There's almost like a the college tuition is the same deal. Kind of like, you know, we force our kids, hey, you got to go to college no matter what you want to study. Just go there. Then you take out this loan and you're strapped for life. And then if you want to try to buy a home, you got two things that you're kind of just buried for the rest of your life. Well, in reality, uh, house prices have uh, exceeded the rate of inflation uh, for any 10-year time period uh, in the last 100 years or so in the United States. And so home ownership is not necessarily a uh, financial windfall. It will be if you handle it correctly. Uh, and for most people, the asset they have in their home is often the biggest asset they have upon retirement. And so if you pay it off over a 15 year period or a 30 year period, uh, you've certainly got something that's remarkable to help you. And then as you're older, maybe you'll be in a nursing home or something and that will be what pays for it. Uh, I think the most important aspect of a home is the place you raise your family. Uh, a home is where you've got neighbors that uh, you have common interests with. Uh, and so uh, home ownership is not about economics necessarily. Home ownership is a concept. It's about having a nest that's yours. Yeah, yeah, really well said, Dave. And what about as far as the real estate agent side of this? Um, uh, I know that, you know, a lot of people find a lot of success. Some people struggle with it. Uh, what is your advice to the guy? You know, a lot of people are actually stuck in jobs that they can't stand. They don't want to work, but because they're married, they have they have their first kid on the way, whatever it may be. They're afraid to kind of pivot, make that move, maybe get into real estate, kind of start their own thing. But they're feeling a little strapped because they don't want to take a chance. Uh, what is the real estate market like right now for the agents and for the young guys or young gals uh, that are coming into the pipeline now? What does it look like for them? You know, real estate's always a tough job to begin. Uh, there are no salaries or advances that are given, so uh, you're on your own. And the problem is that you can study and get a real estate license, but it doesn't teach you the business. It teaches you the legal aspects. In reality, starting out as a beginner, you're going to have to learn the business at the same time you're trying to earn a living. Uh, and so it's incredibly hard work. Uh, everybody thinks it's easy, but it's not. However, if you succeed and you're around for a few years, it becomes a much easier job. The hardest part of the job is getting customers. Uh, if you give good service and you get the referral and your customers say, hey, Dave's a great guy. He'll take care of you. You can trust what he says. Uh, that makes the job pretty darn easy. It's tough if you have to get a, a new customer every day. Yeah, it, no doubt about it. There's definitely a hustle aspect to it. And I've had some of these guys on the podcast here, like Tarek El Musa from Flipper Flop, which became a famous thing. I had Ryan Serhant, who sells the, the big homes in New York, million dollar listings. Uh, it, real estate kind of took on a little world of its own in the reality portion of this. I know the, the flipping houses became like a big craze uh, quite a few years ago. Is that still the way it is now? Is, the, is there money still in this buying and flipping aspect? Uh, what's your take on the re real estate reality shows and stuff? Uh, it's a much tougher deal today than it was, say, uh, three to four years ago. Uh, one of the hottest markets in the country for flipping was the Phoenix metro area. And that uh, uh, I'm involved with a company, one of my sons, and, uh, they've been flipping houses down here for probably, I don't know, 10 years. And so it was a pretty easy job until about a year ago. Uh, now it's slowed down dramatically. Uh, the demand is down, the interest rate's gone up, the prices went up so fast that uh, getting a property at the right price that you could flip it and fix it up and still walk away with some money has been tougher and tougher. It's all cyclical, and this too will pass, but right now is a very tough time to get started in the flipping business. It, it just looks so easy on television, but it, the, <laughs> the headaches are quite severe. 
Yeah, it definitely looks easy when they do it all in a half hour show. Buy the home, fix it up, and flip it all in a half hour. It makes it look like, hey, I can do that. You know, no problem. What, what, what is it? I know you co-founded Remax along with your wife. Uh, you said, you know, you, you have kids that are doing the real estate stuff. What is what were some of the struggles? Uh, I mean, I, I know sometimes I've had other entrepreneurs on here that started businesses with their wife. It could put a very big strain on the marriage, on the relationship, on the family. What were some of the struggles or what was it like to, to, to start this business, get it off the ground with your wife? Well, actually, my wife was my first employee and we did not become romantically involved until we'd been partners for almost 10 years. And so uh, our partnership worked out extremely well. Um, my skill set was uh, a, a very, very successful real estate agent. I knew how to train, teach and mentor, but that was it. Uh, Gail had uh, just gotten married and was a trailing spouse came from St. Louis and her husband was going to be a manager at uh, Media and F. And so she was kind of looking for a job just to kind of get settled and then take something more serious. Uh, she had been a manager at Walston Perina, had a marketing and a management degree. And uh, she was uh, incredibly competent, uh, confident and uh, very poised. And she convinced me in a matter of minutes that, okay, I'll go run the sales end of the business you go start the business. And that meant I needed somebody that could lease property, uh, do the tenant finish, decorate it properly, buy the furniture, the equipment, hire and supervise secretaries and bookkeepers, uh, set up legal contracts, set up a accounting firm. In other words, run the business. And having a partnership that way worked out perfectly. I was in my zone that I understood. She was in her that I respected and she understood. And so by sharing the responsibilities, even though starting the company was difficult, we ran into a lot of financial difficulties. Uh, the recession hit just as we opened. First oil embargo hit. The real estate people couldn't get gas for their cars to show property. And so like most small businesses, first two or three years were terrifying. Uh, after we got a hold of it, we started making a profit. The rest of it became pretty easy. Yeah, and, and incredibly successful as well. Now, I know you mentioned your one son does the flipping, uh, was doing the flipping involved in real estate. Are all your kids involved in real estate at some aspect of this? And uh, what was it like bringing them, following them in, into your footsteps here? No, I made a conscious decision that I did not want my children coming into the company I founded. Uh, at, when I founded it, my youngest was born that summer. And so he was, you know, by 10 years later, he's only 10 years old. And the rest of the kids were, oh, getting close to high school or uh, maybe college. And I just didn't want to follow in the footsteps of the founder. And Remax became an incredible success. And I had this obligation to my uh, officers. I felt that, you know, you helped build this company. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, my kids shouldn't have hit the lucky gene pool and they get your jobs that you built the company for. The kids totally understood it. I promised them I'll help you with anything you want. Uh, they had to work part of the time for college, but uh, that was my attitude, their attitude too. And then I said, you want to build businesses? I'll loan you the money. I'll invest with you. You start it. You found it. And you make your own trail. And uh, they did very well. Uh, my uh, oldest daughter, uh, she and her husband, got married, they tried different businesses. They ended up with a very successful eBay or Amazon business that, uh, I don't know, between the two of them, they do a million something a year in gross. And so that's pretty spectacular. They're happy, happily married now for, God, I think it's close to 25 years. Uh, my uh, oldest son, David Jr., uh, we ran a NASCAR track together in, uh, uh, Atlanta, and that uh, he learned about that. We went into the oil drilling business together in Oklahoma and Kansas, drilled 200 oil wells and made some good money. And then he uh, bought some properties and real estate and flipped them. And today he is a investor with me in Area 15 Ventures, where we are a family hedge fund that uh, invests in up and coming franchisors. My uh, uh, youngest son, Chuck, uh, he became an airline pilot, uh, convinced him at one point that 
the hours and the distance and the times didn't make for a good lifestyle. And uh, he actually started flipping houses, didn't tell me about it. And one day he came over to me and he says, Dad, I have to tell you something. I, the last year I bought 12 houses and uh, he didn't flip them. He bought them, uh, reconditioned them and rented them. And he bought them at the bottom of the market and made a great deal of money at it. And so he's branched out into some other entrepreneurial ventures himself. And then my uh, middle son, John, uh, he was an airline pilot, a medical problem that uh, lost his physical. And uh, he charters boats throughout the Caribbean. He's a captain, loves the lifestyle. He might as well be Jimmy Buffett, uh, but uh, he knows how to handle those yachts and sailing ships. So uh, all four of them have found their way in life. Uh, they're just fabulous kids, great moral values, good standards, and uh, very, very fortunate we uh, have become a very close family, if you will. Wow, really incredible. And I know you said two of them airline pilots. I know you were in the Air Force yourself, uh, and, and, and thank you for your service. Were you a uh, fighter pilot? What was your position in the Air Force when you were in? <laughs> no, uh, I ended up in Laos and Cambodia and uh, Vietnam quite a bit. Uh, but uh, I was never a pilot at the time. Uh, I uh, loved to be a pilot. I applied to the Air Force Academy, but my grades weren't good enough. And so uh, when I got out of the military, I'd started flipping houses when I was still a sergeant. And uh, I got a real estate license not to sell houses. I just wanted to save the commission on my own deals. Uh, but I became very good at it. And so I started building the businesses and and it was quite successful for me. So um, I've actually probably owned over 20 some businesses so far. And uh, most of them I still own. Uh, we own four motorcycle dealerships, Harley, et cetera. Uh, I bred 3000 Arabian horses and uh, have a thousand national champions from my stables. And uh, got the, a privately owned golf course that uh, its only purpose is raising money for charities, and we raise about $10 million a year net for our various charities in the Denver area. It's one of the top 100 courses in the world. And so uh, dabbling in different businesses besides just being stuck in the real estate sector has kept me fresh. It kept me uh, excited about going to work every day because new challenges, even though REMAX was quite a challenge, uh, and being involved uh, with my kids and their businesses was very important to me. Uh, I, I try to keep my mouth shut and quiet. I'll give advice if it's asked for. Uh, and they're all learning and they're doing their own thing. They're great. How did you get into the NASCAR? Now, what was it like for you driving the NASCAR for? I know you did about a decade worth of it. Oh, we were one of the biggest customers of the Marriott chain with all the conventions and 400 meetings a year. And Bill Marriott called me up one day and said, I'm going to take five or six of my biggest customers to uh, Bondurant Race School down in Memphis or in uh, Mesa, Arizona. And I went down for two days and I beat the professional driver's times. And I was uh, about 50 years old at the time. And <laughs> I said, hey, you know, I'm not too old for this and I've got the money. Let's go play NASCAR. So I went and designed a couple cars. I bought a track in uh, Georgia, went down and practiced over the winter. And said, okay, we'll start at the local townie thing. And after a few months of that, I said, nah, I want to go to the big time. I, I want to go to, to Talladega, Las Vegas, Daytona, Watkins Glen, all this stuff. So I put together a race team. We sponsored a couple cars. Uh, I put a team together. I built 60 cars and ran for 10 years and uh, all over the country, different series, and uh, just had a blast. It was, it was so much fun. <laughs> wow. uh, celebrity celebrity status is what it's <laughs> worth it's what it is man wow i, I own remax the biggest company in the country and, and nobody in denver cared who i was i started driving a car and everybody wanted autographs so it was just what a hoot yeah i've had a bunch of them guys on here i had joey logano on uh, last year when he won the championship and Great, uh man. it's yeah, a crazy world that is, and uh, fascinating to watch, and definitely speak to the driver. So, and I know you have a podcast too, Ambition and Grit. What was the genesis of the podcast here? What's that all about? Well, you know, I'm fascinated with how run of the day average people can find extraordinary success, and it's it isn't that difficult to do. 
it's you've got to have the ambition and the grit to do it. Uh, anybody can say, well, I, I dreamed up this concept, but I just never got around to trying it. And so I started looking at all the speakers that we had that came to the REMAX conventions every year. And we do 400 meetings a year. So we're meeting some of the most fascinating people in the world. And in most cases, they weren't Harvard MBAs in any way. They were somebody that just had the grit and the tenacity and they took off in some direction and achieved fabulous success. So mine is part of my legacy is I'd like to pass on uh, some of these ideas that I've learned. Um, in reality, the College of Hard Knocks is a hell of an education. It's just most people can't seem to afford the tuition. And uh, I wish I had a formal education at this point, but I am a lifelong learner. And when I started my company and financially in distress, I tried to figure out how do I get out of this mess? And so uh, necessity helps a lot. You know, you figure out, I don't know what I'm doing. Somebody's got to help me. Who can teach me? And you learn. And so I've been exposed to some of the most successful people in the history of, I don't care what it is, sports, business, politics, religion. And uh, it's fascinating to be around these type of people. And it's amazing that we have all the access, especially with the smartphones now, to listen to so many of these people uh, who are even no longer with us. I know for me, I'm a railroad mechanic. I, I've been doing that for 23 years. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was a recovering alcoholic, recovering addict a whole bit. And it was really listening to guys like Jim Rohn uh, and reading books like uh, uh, Think and Grow Rich that really uh, with Napoleon Hill that really kind of started to shift my own mindset. And I think that there's so much uh, available to people to listen to and to dive into. We have these things in our pocket. We have the whole library. We have we, we have all of these uh, great things to tap into, these sources. And so many people are using it for such nonsense that's out there. And it's mind boggling to me. The information that we walk around with in our pocket could something that never have been dreamed of years ago. And uh, it's right there. And I think so much of it is mindset. So many people are down on America, the American dream. And everyone seems to think the American dream is dead. Uh, what, what do you say about that? Absolutely not. Uh, we focus on the negative. Uh, that's what catches our eye. And if you uh, watch TV, the newspaper, if it bleeds, it leads and all this stuff. That, that isn't what the, what's going on in our world. Uh, you look around the neighborhood I'm in today. There's no crime in this neighborhood. Uh, there might be some divorces and some, you know, addictions and such. That's part of life. It just happens. But this is not an overwhelming mess we're in. 99% of us are doing pretty darn good. And the problem you get into is you got two political parties and you got the radical left and the radical right that's wagging the dog in between. And realistically, I think 80% of us could sit down together and run a pretty good country, but we're getting whacked by both ends of the spectrum. So uh, there's tremendous opportunity today. Uh, the problem you get into is you gotta have the mindset that you want to go someplace with your life. And the easiest thing in the world is turn on the video, watch TikTok, listen to some music and uh, dance and have a good time, but that doesn't make you a success. You can have a heck of a life, but you gotta work. You gotta have the ambition, you have to have the grit, and you gotta pay before you get. And so uh, I'm not a workaholic. Uh, there are time periods in my life when I've worked far more than I should have, and it hurt my family, but there are other time periods in my life that I had that under control. I made a great deal of wealth. I was able to provide wealth for my family. So the point about your family, uh, I was totally devoted to building Remax for about the first five or six years. I mean, consumed with it 18 hours a day. And I was not good to my children. I was not good to my first wife. Uh, I was just, so caught up in this adventure, this marvelous mistress I had called Remax. Um, I noticed my wife was getting tired of taking care of the kids, stay at home mom. And then all of a sudden she wanted to become a pilot. And then that was a wake up call for me. It was near the end of our marriage, but I started seeing, well, I haven't done my half with the kids. And I just totally changed and just, it just took one evening of thinking about it. And I said, by God, I'm going to start working my family. 
And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, divorce still happened. But I said, I'm going to get a motorhome. I'm going to get a speedboat. And uh, weekends with the kids, we're going to the lake. We're going fishing. Uh, we're going to travel a little bit. Uh, and I regained my fatherhood. And it was interesting. Everything that I did, my three sons wanted to do. My daughter was a girl, and she didn't kind of jump into the things we did. But when I started driving race cars, all my kids, they went to driver's school. They went to the racing schools. I wouldn't buy them their cars. They had to find their own sponsors. And I really didn't want them on Daytona. But uh, if they could get there, they could get there. And so one of them is still playing with it quite a bit. Uh, I loved hunting, fishing, camping, I loved skydiving, I loved scuba diving, and all three of them followed along and all those things. And we, as a family, very close and tight knit on those things. My daughter was more of a girly girl. And so she likes the theater, she likes the movies, and she likes the nice dining and all that stuff. And so we participate in that part of her life. But uh, when we're all in town together, we're pretty inseparable. We're constantly doing stuff together. And, and so it's a, it's a nice turnaround from what I almost threw away. And it's so important to see and what you say that your kids all turned out, you know, to, to be successful in their own right. And, and, and it's part of what I talk about, too. And you're right. I mean, my children, they're young yet. My oldest is just set, turning 17 next week. Uh, but I have three boys and a girl myself. And, and, and you're right. They mimic what I want to do. Uh, they, they follow in. They want to follow in their dad's footsteps. And so many of the kids in this country, so many, particularly young men, they're growing up with no father and no father figure in their life. And in my opinion, that's the number one social issue we have in our country right now is the breakdown of our families and the fact that there's so many kids that are growing up without a father in their life. And I really think that's leading to so much of the havoc we're seeing play out in our country. What's your take on that? I'm in total agreement. There's. There's no question. A loving mother is an awesome thing to have. Um, and a lot of single moms do seem to throw their whole heart and soul into it. Um, we've just gotten away from this uh, era of Boy Scouts and the 4-H and the Brownies and so on. And it seems that the, the uh, families without fathers, there's something that takes its place. And it's not the church, it's not the scouts, and it seems to be the lower that you can go, the gangs. Uh, somebody that's nine years old and doesn't feel loved, and the gang makes them feel like you're part of the family, you're part of the gang. But it's just part of the wrong thing. It used to be you were part of the scouts, and everybody pledged to do their best they could and help people across the street. And, you know, and so we just lost focus on it. And it's basically men have lost out over the last 40, 50 years. In my college years, I failed out. Uh, but if you went to study uh, business, uh, you were usually a man. In college, if you were a man, you went to school for medicine, you were a doctor. Uh, if you were going to be uh, a lawyer, or whatever. Women, well, they at that time, uh, if you went to law school, you're going to be a paralegal. If you went to uh, doctor school, no, you're going to be a nurse. Well, if you look at what happened, the whole world changed in 50 years. More than half of all the doctors are female. More than half of all the lawyers are female. More than half of all the engineers are female. And the women have taken upon themselves and they're self-reliant, they've gained their confidence, and they're going places. And so many of the men are dropping out at 10, 11th grade or less, and just saying, oh, I can make money selling drugs, I can do this, I can do that, I don't have to go to college. And so what's happened is the work ethic used to be, men seemed to have it, and women were expected at first to stay at home and be housewives. This whole switch over the last 50 years that women have figured it out, they can be independent, they can be self-sufficient, they don't have to depend on anybody, and they can win at anything they want to work at, and they've embraced it, whereas men, many of them, have squandered it. And that's because they didn't have a strong man in the family that brought them up not to be their best friend, but to be their father. 
Yeah, very well said. And you can definitely see it. And it's really causing a lot of harm in our society without a doubt. And that's why, um, you know, it's so important to and even if you don't have the father to find that father figure, like you said, they used to have these communities where, you know, and I've had a lot of the dads on here that have found that father figure in the coach or through the school system, a teacher or something like that, that has helped them along the way. But you're right. It's when they do find it in the street. That's why we're filling up these prisons with fatherless kids. So. Uh, hopefully we can get our families back together, dads back involved. And I think a lot of this trouble we're seeing would start to go away. And obviously um, you, obviously your legacy is secure in the real estate business. Remax, uh, the most recognizable name in, in, in real estate. Uh, so that legacy is secure, but what would you say you want your legacy to be as a father? Yeah, I would like to think that, uh, uh, I provided a role model, uh, that they would like to emulate. Most people don't understand that we get about 95% of our education from mimicking. And when a baby is born, they don't automatically coo and smile. It's the idiot parents leaning over them with a big smile on their face, talking baby talk, saying, oh, you're so beautiful, my little baby. And they smile and you smile. And so they start mimicking you from the minute their eyes are open and they see that you love them and you care for them. And then by the time they're five or six years old, it's, oh man, I want to grow up just like my mom. I want to be a success. I want to be a good cook. I want to be beautiful and tall, whatever it is. And the boy is saying, I want to be strong like dad. I want to play football, baseball. I want to maybe fly a jet plane and be in the military. And then they get to adolescence and then they start imitating each other. And that starts a whole new set of problems. And then by the time they get to 18 or so, they're imitating each other and they're no longer really looking to parents like they used to. And it's pretty interesting how dumb parents appear to be when you're 10 to 25 years old and how smart your parents are when you reach 40 and 50 years old because you've now had the life experiences they had and you learned the lessons they were trying to convince you of. And so mimicking is so important. And you are the role model for your children. And everybody has problems, whether it's addiction, whether it's workaholics, whatever it is. If you're setting the wrong example, you're setting the wrong example. And sometimes some of us turn our lives around, like me being a workaholic. I turned my life around because I wanted them to see they had a father that really gave a darn. And so when I was trying to build my business, I didn't go to the ball games. I didn't go to the soccer games. I didn't go to the swim meets because business was too important. I caught mine in time. And there isn't always time to do those things, but you got to make it work. You have to make it work for their sake because they're going to imitate you when you're or they're your age. Yeah, very well said, Dave. And uh, obviously, I know you you, you have the uh, the podcast going on now. What are the kind of new ventures you have? What's next for you? What can we look forward to seeing from you here in 2023? What do you got planned? Um, we started a private family business, a hedge fund. Uh, we invest in emerging franchisors. Uh, I put together five partners, and uh, we have our own office. We have our own investment group. Uh, I still work for Remax's chairman of the board. I own about half of the company. So I'm involved with Remax 60, 70 days a year at all the major functions. But with our investment arm, uh, last week we bought a uh, sub sandwich uh, network, 135 uh, restaurants, uh, regional Nevada and the surrounding states called Porta Subs. Uh, They've always stayed regional. They've been around 50 years. Fabulous product, fabulous franchisees. They wanted to expand and they wanted to go worldwide like Remax. So we bought the owner out. He's retired. Did a great job building a regional company. So right now we're changing the company to regionalize it. We hope to be in 50 major cities, oh, in the next 12 months or so. And so uh, it keeps the blood flowing, the mind working. We've got the capital. We got the experience. We know how to expand. We know how to scale up. Uh, we got another uh, chicken concept called uh, Daddy's Chicken Shack. It's a high-end uh, fried chicken sandwiches, gourmet menu. We're kicking that off. And so we stay pretty busy with our business. 
and then we have our personal life. Well, well God bless you. I, I love the hustle, and uh, you, you've helped so many people uh, along the way, uh, getting their own lives started, and you're responsible for so much of the success of so many of the young people, and now uh, have been able to build their own lives because of you. So props to you for everything you've done. And I know you've touched on a little bit here during the talk, but the last thing I want to hit you with, I love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast here, what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about-to-be father who's out there listening? The, the only thing I can tell you that, that I think really makes sense to anybody is don't be afraid of being a father. Uh, understand you're a father. You're not a best friend. You will be the father until you die, but you better be a father until they're 18, 20, 25 years old. After that, that might change to being you are the best friend. That's okay. They've learned the life's lessons they needed to learn. You have to be firm. You have to be a disciplinarian. You can't be their best buddy. You can be friends, but you're dad. As they grow up, that can change. Then you can be a granddad and spoil the kids. Well, very well said. I love the message. This has been an honor for me. I got to say, uh, Dave Linegar, you're a first class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Fatherhood. Thanks and best of luck to you.